demand uh, about 10% over the last year, mirroring uh, an improving economic situation, but also large-scale uh, demographic shifts. Now, as His Excellency the Minister mentioned in his speech this morning, the electricity sector is the respons responsibility of all, and these challenges are perhaps too great for the Ministry of Electricity to tackle alone. So what can... What role can the private sector play in helping achieve Iraq's power sector ambitions? If the panel that sits here today cannot answer this question, then perhaps nobody can, because it includes Dr. Samir Araji, the chairman of Iraq's National Investment Commission, the man responsible for stimulating private sector investment across uh, this country. It also includes William Wakila um, and uh, uh, and Mus'ab al-Khatib, who are responsible for the Iraq operations of GE and Siemens, respectively. Together, they represent almost the entirety of Iraq's power-generating fleet. It also includes Khalid Abu Rihab uh, from Pajesco, who are an EPC management company with extensive experience in this country, but also in Egypt, where Siemens has had some recent success. And last but not least, Harry Estepanian, a senior fellow at the Iraq Energy Institute, who we call on often for his expertise uh, at the International Energy Agency. So without further ado, I wanted to uh, pass the floor to Dr. Samil Araji for his comments on this issue. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Dawlat Naib Raish al-Wizara, Mahali Wazir al-Kahraba, Mahali Sada al-Ikhwa, العزة من النواب وأعضاء السلك الدبلوماسي وكل الحضور مع حضر our uh, diplomatic uh, representatives uh, dear audience it is very useful to uh, speak uh, uh, in Arabic but uh, to give uh, uh, an insight of where investment is the uh, energy sector and its importance in Iraq we have adopted with the ministries, the vital ministries, uh, especially MOP, uh, MOF, uh, uh, a fundamental uh, pillar for the next uh, few years to reach uh, the uh, uh, desired goals in 2030. And we have committed uh, to these goals uh, with uh, the United Nations. Uh, we have uh, made uh, put plans uh, to achieve these goals. Uh, uh, there are two plans, uh, 2018 and 2022, and some uh, and a further plan with the correction of some uh, uh, paragraphs and some uh, points. The first uh, pillar is uh, to find resources for wealth in Iraq, new resources. Uh, from uh, economic uh, uh, aspects, which I think very productive, and service sub sectors, uh, the productive is the oil and gas, uh, and uh, electricity, health, uh, industry, uh, agriculture, uh, transportation, uh, tourism, and uh, communication. The service uh, part is about uh, education and uh, housing. And what relates uh, to the uh, infrastructures, uh, uh, roads, uh, uh, wastewater, and other services to achieve the uh, sustainable development goals in 2013. The second uh, uh, pillar is the uh, reformation uh, in the state to manage the state with uh, financial and economical uh, uh, policies uh, and the important role for the private sector uh, and the uh, industri industrial projects, uh, the uh, SMEs as well. The third pillar, which is very important in this aspect, is the investment, the foreign and local, uh, foreign and national investment to uh, cover uh, some of the requirements of this uh, ambitious plan and basic plan for the uh, prosperity of this country. Uh, today, in its fifth uh, term, uh, we are dependent 
on uh, uh, obtaining uh, uh, many resources from uh, you uh, as uh, their excellencies uh, have mentioned yesterday and today to achieve uh, expansion in the uh, electricity uh, energy uh, and the expansion in the oil industry as well we need uh, large resources for the country that uh, we can provide the required services through them and as have been put in the national development plan therefore the uh, national uh, uh, I will answer some of the uh, questions regarding other sectors, but now we are uh, in the theme of energy. The uh, local or national investment uh, sector uh, is, has very important role, and I could say that 50% uh, of the energy produced today is done by the private sector, the Iraqi private sector, uh, uh, accompanied by the uh, foreign companies and the international companies. Many of them are uh, here today. Uh, Mr. Ahmed Ismail, Mr. Ali Shmara, uh from uh, a car company and from Maysan Energy Company uh, have given us about uh, 8,500 uh, including the expansion uh, a list a list uh, with uh, GE is about 10,000 megawatts Mr. Ali Shmara has um, uh, mentioned the depth of this energy uh, historically, which is uh, my duty to highlight this, uh, since I, I am in the uh, place of leading this sector, the opportunity today and the major challenge is how to obtain resources from this sector. Yesterday. His Excellency uh, Thamer al Adwan has mentioned uh, the importance of uh, the uh, gas and oil and how to product, uh, produce these uh, uh, resources. And uh, today we have seen the ambitions of the Ministry of Electricity as well. Uh, I, ha I have, I have the. Uh, In 2030, maybe, and I leave the numbers to those who mentioned the numbers, so maybe it will be a double uh, energy uh, from what they mentioned in 2030, which is uh, a very ambitious thing. I would say a very important word in this uh, topic as a supporter for the investment and investors. These plans uh, actually will not be successful in electricity unless there will be uh, uh, fees uh, on the citizens that they have to pay uh, because we have to pay, we all have to pay for the electricity fees uh, in order to uh, get to the uh, production that we need. Maybe the state uh, is very supportive uh and we have and i have the honor to be part of the first signature for the uh, investment in the electricity uh, sector uh, uh for the first 6000 followed by the rest uh we have uh, as a very good plan for the retreat uh, from as a state and uh, to uh, give the floor to the investment part but due to the conditions that we have uh, seen uh, from uh, 2012 until now, what we have seen in the electricity sector, it is we haven't achieved what we want. But uh, we wish uh, that, which is very important for our success, uh, uh, we need uh, to achieve what we want. And we have uh, given. Uh, opportunities for uh, collectors, fee collectors, but they didn't do their work. Thank you so much. Shukran jazilan, Dr. Sami Al Araji. Hunaka Nokotain, Aratu and Utab Aha, Maaka, Wawadu Al Kiam Behada Kabla Al Intikali Al Shaks Al Akhar Min Elishna, Dakarta Al Kata Al Khas. 
وذكرت ان مسؤوليه هناك مسؤوليه على المستثمرين من المحليين وكما فهمت ان هناك خم وكما فهمت ان هناك خمسه مشاريع عبر القطر تنفذ هل هل هناك اعتقد بالتاكيد ان الطاقه المتجدده ان تتجه بهذا الاتجاه حبسي تعال انا اؤمن بان أؤمن بأن الطاقة الموجودة حاليا تعني أن لدينا العديد من الطاقات التي هناك حاجة إلى في المستقبل وبالإضافة إلى ذلك أيضا أعتقد أن الصيانة والأعمال اللوجستية لهذا الطاقة طاقة مهم للغاية إذا لا ننظر فقط But also there is a very big and important sector it's called the maintenance and logistics around this sector which I believe it's all most of it is Iraqi nationals a lot of the international companies like G and Siemens depend on Iraqi nationals in that and independent contractors uh, hopefully will, will, will spring out. And of course the renewable energy, all of it that has been declared by the Ministry of Electricity are investment programs. So, so the idea then is to have a supply chain that, uh, that develops and, exactly. and, and, and creates jobs and all the rest of it. But one thing that I wanted to, 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 to to ask you on as well was you mentioned logistics you mentioned maintenance transmission and distribution is there any talk of bringing in private investment here well and unless you give him an incentive and to be very honest i worked on that a lot because i believe the success of your program to have the almost generated capacity reaches its goal without these losses, whether it be losses out of the, let's say, the aging of the network or the, what we call it, the malfunctioning of the, of the network itself. Uh, I believe that uh, in, in, in this, if we could give an incentive enough to combine both transmission, distribution, and collection, both, and guarantee the collection in a good manner, we will achieve the goal that we were looking for. But if you could just give him one segment of it and uh, just let him off uh, uh, facing the reality of the hour, I don't think he will succeed. So what we are looking at in the National Investment Commission, and this is that we are looking at a combination of transmission, distribution, and collection of the money in a manner that hopefully working, uh, we are working on ideas with the Ministry of Electricity to see how we reach it. So far, which it has not, and I would like to say, uh, frankly, uh, the collection was given also the, re uh, the responsibility of maintenance yeah. of the network itself as well. Mm -hmm. But because of the limited amount of return on your investment in this, has yeah. not allowed the investors to go ahead and maintain the distribution network. Therefore, we have to ensure that the collection is a proper, they get their share, and they enter, hopefully, in a big transaction to try to repair and uh, rehabilitate the network. So this is a, this is a discussion that goes, that uh, kind of spans between the National Investment Commission, but of course, the Ministry of Electricity For in terms sure. of tariff reform and perhaps exactly. even subsidies reform. Exactly. Uh, unless, unless you do otherwise, it's going to be difficult to incentivize the kind of... The, the reality of the hour that we are living it right now we have signed uh, several, you know, the number I could say it, but, you know, it's still variable. But uh, we have s almost, uh, most of the provinces has been covered, yeah. either partially or totally, by private collectors or tariff, let's say, uh, uh, investors, tar electricity tariffs investors. We could call it that way, Ivan. This is a new word that I'm using but they have not been able to achieve what we have wanted them to achieve because the reality of the hour still, a lot of the people look at electricity as God-given gift yeah. by the government that has to be given to a lot of these people. 
And unless we really enter into the field and say, look, uh, this is produced at such and such cost, and you have this share, and I believe we can, we can convince them if we could do the following. For example, we could give a good support, let's say, to the uh, uh, needed uh, segments of the population that will all, it will be a very let's say a small segment that he will be paying and then as the Ministry of Electricity is doing but we have we are not at the uh, let's say level that we can uh, say it's a very satisfactory level uh, then you go exponentially with with whatever consumption you have but uh, since the majority of the people get uh, a power that in certain provinces is interrupted power mm -hmm. and they spend a lot of money from their income on independent producers, Mualidat, yeah. saying he's not able to pay here and there. And Mualida, if he does not pay, he takes off the plug and leave him. Yeah. So he is depending on the generosity of the government to give him whatever it gives him. And that has been really a, a difficult combination yeah. for across sector, a big sector of the population. And therefore, we have to put a program, the Ministry of Electricity, us, the United, and any other uh, agency in the government to try to um, get this process moving in a successful manner, not to expand too much and without having a resource yeah. opposite. So what we did, we went ahead with all the provinces opening up but we don't have enough electricity to, to support it because he is going to pay when you give him 24 hours. Yeah. What will he do? He'll pull out from independent producers and give it to you. But he cannot pay the two at one time. Therefore, what I proposed is that let's go down, look at some of the okay sectors or segments or sections of these governorates and then move ahead as the power producing improve yeah. And then you will convince the people that, okay, I am giving you, give me a return. These are some of the difficulties that we face. So, so this last point that you mentioned, and I, I will want to call on um, both of you, William and, and Mosab, after your interventions on this issue specifically, because it seems to me like there is this vicious cycle right now where you have low investment because you're, in, you're, you're, you're looking at uh, relying on the, the power ministry's capital expenditure uh, allocation. The, uh, the production of electricity suffers, people are looking to neighborhood generators, these guys capture quite large revenues and, and therefore they're not paying their electricity bills and so there's not enough of an investment budget back to the ministry. Where do you break that cycle? I'll, William, I think it's time for your, your intervention, but uh, at the same time, if you, could, if you could establish where it is that you break this cycle, how to break the cycle of low investment and low revenues uh, and what the Iraqi government can do to, to remedy that and what role the private sector has uh, in helping to remedy that? Right, that's many questions in one, so let me break it relative to what uh, companies like GE can bring forward in terms of technology, in terms of products, and in terms of skills, people, and so on. Uh, what I cannot help you with is the policy question. Okay, so we know ultimately what Iraq needs, similar to every other country in the region, is reliable, cost-effective power that's accessible to the entire population. Um, we believe we bring multiple solutions, as we have been doing uh, over the past 40, 50 years, really more intensively over the last 10, 15 years, when you look at the installed base in the country, despite all the challenges, the technology we brought was the best fit. When you look at uh, lack of clean fuel, for example, shortage of gas, uh, when we needed gas turbines to run on heavy fuel and crude, you know, that was something we were able to help with. Similarly, on the transmission side, obviously, the substations that we are building and we will continue to build now that we're talking about uh, rebuilding the western areas, Anbar, interconnection to Jordan, other countries. So that's another side that GE can help with. Um, we can talk about technologies that fit the times relative to so what we've been able to do in the past and we can also take a look at the future. We know once the fuel issue, for example, is fixed in this country, 
we will also bring the right technology for that time. To give you an example, John, our chairman, talked about the latest HA technology. Just to give you a ballpark figure, when he talks about 64% efficiency, that means we can generate twice the power for the same amount of fuel. That is significant. So all in due time will hopefully contribute to a brighter future in Iraq. Where we talk about now the policy issues, you know, uh, is there enough investment available, you know, and we hear different ideas about privatized generation, and I think the country has taken significant steps. So the multiple IPPs, a lot of them are partnering with us. So, so Mass Global, Shamara, various others, working using GE technology, GE products in a private mode. Uh, if you take a look at the ultimate challenge, we know the needs are larger than the means. So all of the studies can tell you whether it's generation, transmission, distribution, just this monumental, you know, with all the baggage, the history, pre-war, you know, we're talking the last 30, 40 years, there has been an underinvestment in this sector. And when we look at the tens of billions of dollars that are needed, it becomes very clear the limitation is going to be in budgeting. So very clear, we cannot do it on EPCF, we cannot do it all on the government budget. So therefore, the private sector is relevant. What I wanted to say is beyond privatized generation, I think there needs to be more thinking. I think we've heard some of that. I was just in Abu Dhabi, World Energy Council, so we've heard His Excellency, Dr. Loai Thamer, talk about touching on tariff reform, because that's really what it comes down to. Ultimately, electricity needs to pay for itself. If you look at all the countries around you, and they've all gone through similar experiences, you know, you can look at all the Gulf countries, where they really did not even need to privatize. You know, they had the means to give away power for free. Look at Jordan, for example, and their experience over the past 15, 20 years. It wasn't only privatized generation, it was privatized distribution. Okay, so there is a policy matter, there are multiple layers to it, there is a legal framework that needs to go, it's a longer term prospect, so on average you're talking eight to ten years. Assuming you've got the political will, you've got consensus that that's the way forward. Once the consumer understands that ultimately it will be more cost effective to pay the $20, $30 for his monthly or her monthly bill as compared to the $200 and $300 that are paid to run a diesel generator that's adding to the pollution. That's, and that's really what it comes down to. So once I think we figure out the privatized distribution, and there's been many experiments here, I think we're not there yet, I think that would be the key to move the entire sector forward. So this, this, uh, this issue you talk about of tariff collection, uh, you know, government versus uh, private sector generation is something that we looked into quite considerably in the IEA and found that the, the average household bill is actually extremely high over here, but that that's being captured by the neighborhood generators who are, of course, charging almost monopoly rents on, on, uh, on capacity rather than consumption. So it's also a very, very inefficient way to run a system, but, uh, but completely agree with everything uh, that you have said. May I call in Mus'ab, because of course you uh, play a very similar role uh, to, to, to GE um, in, in this country, and we'd like to get your perspective. Well, I, I don't think that this is a, a technology issue. Uh, Siemens is uniquely uh, positioned uh, to tackle the problems that exist in the power generation, transmission, and distribution uh, subsectors of the, uh, of the electri electricity sector. However, it is a, a policy and incentive uh, problem. It's a high friction issue that is uh, also paradoxical at the same time. Uh, the government itself uh, is the sustainer of the electricity sector, yet it also must find the discipline to uh, extricate itself from it. And that's a difficult role uh, to master. That can be done through policy, and by um, um, 
ensuring that, that, that uh, foreign investors are, in, are sufficiently incentivized in order to take over the transmission and distribution sector slowly. Yes. Uh, thus far, the, um, the experiments in privatization on the distribution sector have not been, uh, have not yielded the desirable results. Uh, so I think more work needs to be done in realigning those incentives uh, appropriately um, and um, ensuring that, that there is a runway for growth uh, for the distribution sector uh, as well as the transmission sector. I mean, ultimately, these three subsectors have got to be uh, become more independent from one another and in the hands of utilities. Uh, but that journey has to begin somewhere. Uh, and, the, uh, and it's up to the government to, to at the same time, you know, maintain the current, uh, the current uh, production and, expect and live up to the expectations of the population while at the same time planning for the day when it divorces itself from it. Okay. So uh, I'd like to, to, to call on, on Khalid, who, uh, whose company has uh, been here for, for around eight years, but has obviously quite significant experience in Egypt as well. And you are in some ways on the other side of this equation, you do the EPCM uh, for, for large companies. Now, one of the things I'd like to ask you about is what are the impediments that you're facing? Where is it that you feel uh, uh, Iraqi cadres need to be built? And I suppose I think this is also a question for, for William and for Mus'ab as well. I mean, what are the impediments that you've been seeing uh, and, and, and how best to, uh, uh, to, to, to remedy them, specifically also from the point of view of people power, man and woman power, I suppose. Are you seeing that? Uh, they're up to the level that you would expect and what can be done to, to help it. First, uh, with, with Khalid and then... <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> first, I would like to say that uh, Pijesco is uh, an engineering company. Its main charter is to provide engineering and uh, procurement construction management services for power plant projects and also to provide startup commissioning and design training programs and improve the human resources of the client, any client. Uh, as uh, most have mentioned, I think the tariff issue and the uh, return on the investment is a technology issue. It's a matter of policies and strategies of the concerned government. However, uh, this uh, could be, uh, I also agree with His Excellency that achieving fair tariff uh, would encourage uh, more investment in the, in the power sector and uh, this can uh, only be designed and achieved by the government and its policies. And we have uh, uh, something, a model we had done in Egypt uh, in the last, uh, in the recent years, where the uh, government has adopted a subsidies, subsidies lifting program for the uh, electricity prices. But in order to do that, it was a gradual program, but in order to do that, you have to supply reliable power to the people, yes. to the consumers. And this is done by cooperating with companies like Siemens and GE and put more capacity on a fast-track basis and I am proud that Pijesco was uh, part of uh, this program that resulted in a reliable uh, power capacity in the grid with a remarkable reserve that can compensate for any interruption and then people start to feel that they can rely on the supply of power then they are now convinced that they have to pay for that power. The other factor is the transparency that you announce in front, in advance, that next year the subsidies will be left by that percentage, the next the year after will be that much, so there are no surprises. This is, uh, this is what I have to comment on this, uh, on yep. this issue. 
The other thing, uh, investment in the power sector, in our opinion in Pijesco, is not only investment in money, but also uh, it has to be investment in, uh, in the human resources and the human capital. Because uh, the uh, building uh, capacities, uh, either generation facilities or transmission lines and substations, without having the, uh, the resources that can operate and maintain them efficiently, then there will be a wasted uh, investment. Uh, in Pijesco, we have uh, started a uh, few years ago uh, a good program with the Ministry of Electricity here in Iraq to uh, study establishing a center within the ministry to provide uh, some engineering services for the ministry projects, things like design reviews, some uh, procurement know-how, uh, tendering knowledge and uh, evaluation, things like that, performance testing, things like that. And uh, we started that program by having around 25 Iraqi engineers in our offices in Cairo to uh, train them on all these aspects, including planning and project controls. And uh, we were hoping that uh, we could continue this program with the ministry, and I think we uh, started recently discussion about uh, this concept, and we are hoping to continue this program because we do believe that without human resources, good human resources, capable to maintain these investment, then uh, you are missing a very important element. Whether the projects are private or governmental, human resources are very important. And I think GE mentioned in, uh, in their uh, word that uh, they have trained 800 people, Iraqi elements, yeah. in different aspects of operation and maintenance. Uh, more in, than that. Really. Now more I, than that, okay. I, I can speak I, about I, I guess. And I, and, and I believe in Egypt, Siemens did the same. They have trained over six, seven hundred people from the electricity se sector. And they were providing edge frame turbines, which is a complicated technology. And now is uh, operated and maintained by uh, local elements. We believe that this can be achieved easily in Iraq. However, Pichesco is focusing on other things other than uh, operation and maintenance, but we are talking about localizing the know-how of how to plan, how to manage, how to safeguard any uh, new uh, power project. And this is what we are trying to do here in the country, and uh, inshallah we'll be successful in, uh, in, in doing this. So you you said uh, you know increasing capacity then increasing improving the grid and then starting to talk about tariff reform and this is this is the element that's that's interesting to me which is that requires investment and i'd like to hear from siemens and from ge what are your assessments of the capital needs to bring iraq to the level where you have reliable uh, electricity supply what i mean you you've both both your companies did assessments on on the needs for iraq what are we talking about in terms of capital cost? Do you want to take that one? Um, you can take it in turn. No, well, I think the numbers you, yeah. are fairly clear. So um, if you look at generation, we're looking demand growth going from 6 7% now up to 10% a year. So you're talking 2 gigawatts a year. That's for the next 5, 10, 15 years. Multiply each gigawatt by roughly 1 billion. It gives you a figure. If you look at distribution, that's been really set behind over the time, hasn't received the attention, we're just getting to it. That's a, probably a $20 billion problem. Transmission, as we've seen last summer, you know, we're approaching the limits. So as we get to 18, 19 gigawatts, we come very close to failures. Yeah. Uh, that would be substantial. So one fold can actually knock out 70, 80% of the country, as we have just seen. So that means further investments into transmission. And again, that's 400 kV substations, 132 kV substations, overhead lines like the ones we are executing right now and uh, the next project in Anbar and interconnection areas. So it's a substantial investment that's needed. Um, we're talking on the orders of 30, 40 billion dollars. Just depends whether you want to execute in five years, 10 years, or 15 yeah. years. So balance that against constraints and budget. That gives you the answer. You cannot just depend on government budget. You need to bring in the private sector to help fund it. Structured 
project finance yeah. is the way to go, similar to what's been happening again across the region. So it's not rocket science. It just requires the right partners. Um, maybe starting with the political will first, but we see that moving. Um, financing is a challenge, I have to tell you. Uh, we know from experience, uh, it's taken us a bit longer. You know, we've worked on over $2 billion worth of financing, mostly on ECA basis. So we know that takes quite a bit of a challenge. And we depend on the help of the right people here. Dr. Araji, very extremely helpful. You know, just down to simple matters, how to get things. Our colleagues and partners at the Ministry of Finance, again, I think they see the importance to move forward. Really, the entire government here mm. is now much more sensitized that time is of the essence. When we're looking at the gap, so, I continue to say the cup is half full, right? Everybody complains we haven't fixed electricity. But when you consider we started with 3,000 megawatts yeah. back in 2003, stayed hanging around three, four, five for many years, right? And it wasn't until the last eight years or so where we start to pick up the pace. To date, even at five times that power, six times that power, we still have a gap of six yeah. gigawatts and the gap can increase. So, so that gives you an yeah. idea about how things are connected. No, thank you. That's that's it, it's kind of harrowing to think that just for the distribution network you need 20 billion, which is, you know, a fair segment of the Iraqi national budget, let alone the budget for the Ministry of Electricity. So, you know, looking at these these financing structures will obviously be quite essential. Musab, how do these numbers tally with your own assessments? Well, our assessments aren't very different. I think we both get our uh, information from the Ministry of Electricity who uh, is in is the one that uh, assesses these uh, investment requirements, and I agree with uh, my colleague Bill about about that. And I think the Minister of Electricity mentioned a figure of uh, 30 billion uh, recently. Uh, I mean, th the rule of thumb for power generation is is uh, right current at current prices is a billion for each gigawatt. Uh, it it's not as easy to have a rule of thumb for transmission and distribution. Yeah. So. Uh, because they're they're more uh, diverse and, and more complex in a way. Um, it's that last mile that is uh, challenging, yeah, and uh, and quite costly. And g given the lack of investment uh, in in these uh, subsectors, it's easy to imagine uh, having to uh, contemplate somewhere between twenty and thirty billion. Uh, but the thing is, we, you know, this is not just about cost. We need to look at the social benefits that come from it. Uh, the, the development of the electricity sector, um, as uh, my colleague on the, on the left mentioned, Khaled, he, he talked about the human element. I mean, we, we rarely look at, you know, we're, we're installing all this sophisticated equipment, but ultimately, Yes, we, we will bring people uh, expertise from abroad to the help of the installation, commissioning, and, and erection of these uh, of this infrastructure. But it's ultimately Iraqis who have to do the work to maintain it. So there's a there's a massive social benefit that comes along with that. Um, I mean, this is kind of like looking at it from an economics point of view, uh, which is a social science, and the accounting point of view, which is not. I know that the accountants are going to hit me afterwards, but. Uh, <laughs> Basically, there, you know, we need to look at the, the medium to long-term benefits to society in addition to looking at what the costs are. Uh, and there, there, along with that come um, the economic development uh, in addition to the knowledge transfer that companies like Siemens can offer to uh, Iraqi engineers um, and, and technicians. If I may say, actually speaking as an economist, when I, when, I, when I saw the news of both of your plans, one of the things that struck me was the fact that you were looking at it as an integrated kind of economic development plan. Yep. Both of you made quite considerable uh, 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 you know, input into, into the gas capture story, which is obviously a huge waste in this country. And so, um, you know, of course, to completely, completely tell you with, with our thinking as well. I wanted to call on Harry Estepanian, uh, who, who has a presentation, who will take, take us through some of the, the technological, but also the, the, uh, uh, the, the 
the legislative issues that need to be tackled uh, to, to try to incentivize private sector investment. Yeah, thank uh, you, Ali. Uh, I just wanted to have a quick uh, go through my presentation because there are quite a few figures that I wanted to show you of the scale of the problem that we have right now. Um, really, uh, I want just to go through quickly what is the uh, public-private um, part, um, uh, partnership and how they can play a role in uh, the electricity sector of Iraq. Uh, really, uh, the, uh, the model of the uh, participation of the private sector in providing services to the, um, uh, to the government is not only concerning to reduce the gap between uh, the, uh, the supply and demand in electricity, but it also is related to the uh, reconstruction work after the war on ISIS. Um, those are the figures that I wanted to show you. Uh, those came from the Minister of Planning uh, immediately after the end of the war in June 2017. As you can see, uh, the affected areas, we had um, eight power stations. We were completely destroyed and nine power stations were partially destroyed. And the estimate damage to the electricity sector in 2017 was estimated around uh, 7 billion. This figure came from the World Bank. Um, uh, the damage to the uh, oil sector uh, was around 4.3, so you can see that it's exceeding 11 billion dollar or two, uh, 12 billion dollars, the damage to the energy sector uh, collectively. Uh, this is a, a graph that I wanted to show you of the scale of the destruction that happened uh, in the affected areas uh, due to the war. You can see the, the most of the damages were in the distribution uh, sector, uh, substations followed by transmission, generation, and so on. And also you can see the, the damage that happened into the networks. So this can give you a, a, a brief outlook of the uh, amount of the work that needs to be done in the next uh, eight years uh, plus. Um, this is the, the plan that the Ministry of Planning with the help of the World Bank came with for the next eight years. What needs to be done in the first one to three years, which is basically provide an emergency electricity to those affected areas, um, add as much as possible power to enable the internally displaced uh, people to get back to their homes. And then in the midterm, you will think about reinforcing your network by adding additional generation and then improve the reliability. But on the long run, uh, this is the plan that the ministry is also um, planning to do right now, is to reform the sector so we can have a sustainable uh, power uh, to the entire country. Um, this is uh, the, uh, some figures about the current uh, fiscal budget, for example, um, to, the, uh, to Iraq. One of the ones which I um, like it very much, and from my experience in the Gulf region, actually we applied it successfully, is what I call it Iraqization, uh, in terms of Saudization or Kuwaitization, which means that the, the private sector will start using as many Iraqis as possible, so at the end, uh, you will end with a model that uses like 90-95% of the local um, uh, forces, local workforces uh, to, to operate the private sector. This is um, a graph that um, probably some uh, are familiar with it, how much you are going to invest if you are of the government uh, in developing your electricity sector you can see in, in the model on the left, this is what we have right now at the, at the ministry, where we can see that there's a huge um, investment is required at the inception of uh, the, uh, the projects, and then you have 
this 25 years of operation and maintenance, fuel costs and everything distributed over 25 years. Well, in the pub, uh, public-private um, partnership model, you will see that that is nicely distributed over the 25 years of contract you have between the private uh, partner. Um, the important thing that um, I've seen many investors when they are coming to Iraq talking about risk and risk mitigation. Um, probably some of you are aware of the uh, renewable uh, energy that Iraq is planning to introduce uh, shortly, uh, um, this year or next year at most, um, the high LCOEs. And the LCOE in Iraq is uh, at least four or five times higher than the neighboring countries. And when you come to the investors and you say, why the LCOE is so high in, in, in Iraq? They, immediately they will come and say that the risk is high. And then you will tell them why the risk is high. Then they will come and number it for you and say, well, it's security, for example. They will come, insurance is high. Uh, all these kind of things, logistics, uh, infrastructure, all these kind of things, excuses will come to tell you that the LCOE is so high, it doesn't make sense for us to invest in Iraq. And the government will say, well, look, uh, why, why it is 2.5 in Saudi Arabia, why it is uh, 6, 7, or 10 in Iraq, they will come and say, well, look, I'm going to pay like $1 million for security every month. So that kind of things um, that the government needs to uh, think about and how to medicate those risks. Of course, um, the, uh, the other one which... Uh, I mean, of course, one of the things that um, I think uh, when we spoke about tariffs, um, w the important issue is the affordability. We shouldn't forget about affordability. If we are going through this transition from the public sector to the private sector, we should be very careful with the affordability. We shouldn't put this burden on on the, on the public consumers to pay for the extra uh, tariffs while we forget that we need to optimize our, um, uh, optimize our costs on the operation and maintenance, for example, efficiency, heat rates, uh, you know, fuel transmission, fuel costs, etc. So those are kind of things that um, also needs to be included in our economic model. Um, this is one graph, quickly, I want to go through it. This is a, a typical structure that the government can adopt for the P3 models, where um, they can inject, there's, that doesn't stop the government to inject actually equity into the uh, SPV. Uh, they can go with partnership with the bankers or the investors in developing the SPV uh, uh, and uh, and then probably um, you know go for IPO at some stage and uh, sell the shares to the public. Um, so those are some of the challenges that um, I believe are uh, quite important uh, for Iraq uh, to tackle. And uh, the two important things. Um, that really are missing in Iraq right now is uh, first the P3 um, law. There is no law for public-private partnership uh, in Iraq right now, in place. And that's very important thing which makes many investors uh, cautious to come to Iraq because there's no guarantees on, on the legal side to come and invest in, in, um, in Iraq. And, and the important things about the PPP law that it gives uh, clear directions for the investors of how to come in, how to invest in Iraq, 
uh, and how uh, to develop their projects. The other thing which is important uh, for them is uh, the PPP law will give a good signal to the investors to come. So if you have a law in place, the investor will come. If there's no law, there will be lots of ambiguity about it and they might create lots of confusion in the future. Sorry, Harry. There's a couple of things that you mentioned that I'd like to bring the, the, um, yes. the panel in. I think, I think I'm done. That's great. I Be think I'm done. Because the, the, the panel will, will shortly end, but I wanted to yes. bring it back to the panel Sorry. and, of course, Harry. I, I will leave it this to you. Okay. Uh, except I will leave it this to you, except the, the, the Beijing power station, which was announced yesterday, uh, it's gone now. I think we signed the contract with uh, Siemens about this. But you can see there are lots of potentials for uh, the private sector involvement in, 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 in developing the uh, electricity sector. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Now, one, one of the areas that Harry mentioned in his presentation was this, this perception of risk inside of Iraq and a 25-year term, uh, you know, recouping your costs over 25 years. One of the one of the things that we tried to look at was how does that compare to uh, what if you had a, an accelerated capital cost recovery? So rather than 25 years, you shorten that span. What does that do to the levelized cost of electricity that Harry mentioned? Now, one of the things is if you benchmark it against uh, neighborhood generators, any option you choose is going to be cheaper. So Dr. Araji, has there been any discussion on trying to incentivize the investment, bring down the costs reduce the, 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 uh, the risk to investors by shortening the capital recovery term of investment? To begin with, very quickly, I believe uh, there are so many protection means and methods for the investors in Iraq that who are involved with us, they know it really. We you um, where we are at and what's ahead to try to go through this massive, uh, let's say, uh, uh, bureaucracy that uh, we have to uh, clear in front of investors to, to reach the goals that uh, we have put in timing and responsibility. Uh, I would like to talk about three things uh, in reply to your, uh, uh, to your question. Number one, uh, I believe that uh, uh, the uh, bilateral, let's say, contract between the investor and between the government represented by the Ministry of Electricity, uh, whether it, is, it will be the power purchase agreement or the main contract between the National Investment Commission, Ministry of Electricity and the, uh, and the contract and the investor uh, gives a lot of incentives and set the terms of the return of his investments. It depends on the model that he's presenting. So when he presents a model that he would like to recover on such and such time and uh, would like to have, let's say, the following guarantees, the following support and so on, it's to be written right in the, and that's what we've done to a lot of investors and that's what we are doing. On the PPP, really, that um, I would like to say that there has been mixed messages came in to us from people of in the neighboring, in the region. Some say that you will not, at the minute you write the, and I for the first time say it in a panel like this, some say you will, the minute you put the PPP law, you will not have the resilience and the capability to try to maneuver, try to give the best you can to the investors uh, in uh, the current circumstances. Therefore, wait and see the experiences of the people in the region and try to give all the assurance and all the capability to the investors in the bilateral agreements that you will have with it. And our good friend and the panelists have said, well, investors would like to know exactly where things are at. Yeah, correct. So we are, for the first time, the government has uh, passed this. It's right on the way to the parliament. I think it will be discussed uh, extensively the benefits and uh, uh, the, uh, let's say, this benefits of having two for every little thing, big thing. If you want to change a law, you'll have to go back to the, to the, to the, to the parliament to change. While you have, uh, uh, for example, a new experience 
that you are moving on uh, <clears throat> and benefiting from, excuse me, the experiences of others. The third and uh, last point that I would like to put that I believe uh, the uh, market of Iraq is capable of absorbing uh, the, uh, let's say, the big capital of investors in the energy region, in the energy sector, whether it be electricity, or it be uh, uh, oil or gas and so on. This has historically been as, a, as an energy country, and we have not harnessed the benefits of it. And therefore, I believe that uh, with all the protections that we have given, whether it be in the investment law, whether it will be in the bilateral investment agreement, whether it be in the uh, bilateral treaties that we have with many countries, whether it be not, uh, bilateral or multilateral, uh, which we have. We are uh, members of so many other uh, 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 treaty organizations that would, could give a lot of uh, protection, a lot of, uh, let's say, guarantees uh, uh, to the investor to put us uh, much of his capital and uh, in a guided way, in a cost-benefit analysis and economical, let's say, model, he could recover as much as possible uh, uh, with um, an ever-developing economy because the next 10 years we are going to open up in so many sectors, whether it will be in the sectors that I mentioned, or the uh, service sectors, especially housing and uh, infrastructure, and it would, should require a lot of electricity and a lot of uh, energy derivatives that you need, because these, uh, uh, these, uh, uh, the plan that we have, two and a half to three million housing units to be built, and that's, that's a goal, I, whether you build it or not, but we are working on that. Uh, it needs a lot of electricity, it needs gas, it needs uh, all the uh, infrastructure that uh, is uh, developed with it, whether it be transmission, it be distribution, whatever it is. So you're talking about an energy country developing, has a robust, let's say, plan to meet the requirements. And I believe that uh, uh, the investors I'm not minimizing any investment scheme has some difficulties of different, let's say, levels. But I would say, on the whole, I'm optimistic that the investment in Iraq over the next 10 years will be through uh, with companies or countries, and especially between uh, major countries that we are cooperating on with, uh, that they could cover a lot of the guarantees to their companies as well as the benefits that we put from our side. So, uh, speaking as your compatriot, I hope that this vision actually comes true. Uh, for well, the, I hope for this so. We are working on it. Yep. Cognizant of uh, the time we have left, can I give a minute to each of our uh, remaining panelists to give their final thoughts on where they see the future of this uh, participation of the private sector? We'll start with Harry. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, as I said, uh, Ali, in the presentation, the, the most important thing for Iraq now is legislation. This is very important. Unless you have a clean cut legislations in Iraq that will encourage the investors to come, I, d I think the pace will be very slow. We have to get those les legislations drafted, put it in front of the parliament, and get the approval as soon as possible. That's the, uh, the main thing. The second issue that, as I mentioned in the presentation, is the risk mitigation. We have to work uh, closely, the public sector, with the private sector closely, either to mitigate the risk, share the risk, you know, whichever way you can find it, so we can get on, on and start those projects as soon as possible. There's a lot of work needs to be done, especially in the affected areas right now. Thank you. Please, Khal, your, your final thoughts. Well, that's a good final thought then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you need, you need, you need to have uh, legislation that uh, can fit with the targets of the uh, government. I understand that, uh, and I agree with His Excellency, that the next 10 years will be, uh, hopefully, inshallah, very prosperous for Iraq. And this requires a lot of work from the government side 
to put in place the uh, required legislation to encourage uh, investors to come and also to put the uh, guidelines for how to uh, in legislation not only for investment but also for the tendering uh, processes for the evaluation to ensure transparent uh, procedures for selecting contractors and suppliers and this will help very much to attract more investment to the country. Thank you. Sorry. I don't have any words of wisdom beyond what Harry has said. Uh, I think he encapsulated uh, the issue in a, in, a, in a crystal clear fashion. Uh, the, the only thing I would add is that we're, until, until that day that the, that the legislative environment catches up with the economic requirements of the country and its development requirements, we will continue to do what we do, uh, which is work on rebuilding the infrastructure, um, accepting the risks that Harry clearly outlined, um, and, uh, and those risks, what, that, what Harry is talking about, is that uh, w when you have risk, it means cost, and that, that mm -hmm. is, and that gets paid directly out of the, uh, the state budget. And, and I mean, nobody here wants to increase risk for, for, for the state, but it's also the state's job to minimize it. Yeah. Uh, we try to reduce costs because uh, we see it as being senseless to pay, for example, security costs, but unfortunately we must. Uh, and um, again, we, we try, it's, it's just a balancing act that we try to, uh, uh, to master. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Bill, last but not least. Well, on a more cheerful note, I, I mean, risk is such a gloomy topic. Uh, we don't want to leave depressed. I, I, uh, I see a brighter future. And I think, you know, I mean, we can spend an hour talk about project bankability, IRR, and so on, but that hasn't really stopped the people in this room from investing and moving. And that's really the only way forward. So, in my perspective, the best way to mitigate risk is the people, people we have here, whether it's our employees, in the video clip that we flashed, I could have pointed out Rima, who's now part of our project management leadership program. I could have pointed out Adil, who is now installing the substation in the Mosul area. I could have pointed Wafi, who's working with Central Bank, TBI, Ministry of Finance, to help with the financing. That's where we need to invest. We can't just stop, lay back and say, too risky, you know, not worth it. So from that perspective, really, um, I'm more optimistic. Uh, it's just a question of maybe a little more patient, but don't stop moving. The Minister, His Excellency, talks about electricity as being mas'uliya tadamuniya. Roughly translated to electricity is really to address it is everyone's mm. problem or everybody. You know, I'd like to read more a translation of solidarity, of really feeling the country, the needs, the challenges on the ground, mm -hmm. and just get down to business and go do it. That's how I see things, and I do see a brighter future for Iraq, inshallah. Well, those are fantastic words to end with. As, as everybody here knows, the resilience and the ability of this country to come through things that are difficult is probably unparalleled uh, in the world, and so Hopefully some of that tenacity can, can filter in to the electricity sector and beyond all uh, other parts of the economy. All that's left for me to do is to thank our panelists, His Excellency, Dr. Sami al uh, uh, William Wakila, Bill Wakila, Mus'ab al-Khatib, uh, Khalid Abu Rihab, and Harry Stepanian. Thank you so much. Um, the next uh, uh, item on the agenda is a coffee break, um, and I feel like it's well-deserved at this point. So thank you very much again. <laughs>